All right, so yes, yeah, so you go to the website, so you go here and then go to our course. You'll see both the slides for today to have the quiz and also a link to the quiz itself. All right, so and this quiz is easy, right? So this is just getting out the basic core idea of can you read a tree? So make sure you have this down, All right? Um, the more detailed content quizzes will come, will come later, but you just want to make sure you read a tree, okay? So, boom. And reading ahead won't help you because they don't have the answers on the, on the slides. I just thought this was the, the slides for the day. It is the other slides for the day, but it includes the quiz. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh. I did not catch that issue. But yeah, you can go to Google. So on, on my website, there's a link to the Google Drive form, and you can then take the quiz. So first question. Oh, so we're doing it now. Yeah, now. Not yeah, yeah, oh. the quiz now. <laughs> I'm not okay. It's not letting you go. So if you go to quiz. You can take it. It's fine. Yeah. So does it work? So the quiz link here. I'm I'm all I'm in. I'm all in. Yeah, but someone couldn't link to it, so just make sure. Can everyone get to this now? If it's not working, raise your hand. Well, you, you, you matter. Um, it's not working. It's just you. Oh, fine. It's not working. Right. I actually just uses Lix, which is a text-based browser. Um, all right. So, these trees below is false, given the larger phylogeny above. This is, this is a science paper, so paper called in science about um, a standard assessment to use for, for students to see if they understand how to read a tree. Typically, it's an educational assessment that's published in science. Yeah, and he taught both me and my mother. Um, she was a, she was a high school biology teacher, and so as the outreach to teachers. And so. Yeah. 
see one, one more minute for this one. Clear <coughs> clickers would be nice, but they don't have to all take this bucks for clickers and use again. You keep 30 bucks instead. All right, next question. And don't submit the form until all these are done. All right. One of these things is not like the other. We're taking a quiz. That's the science. It's apparently, it's apparently a hard quiz. One more minute. There's three questions, right? There's only a second. And that's what. When you figure it out, hit submit. Everyone ready? Yes? No? Yes? Okay. All right. So let me close.
No, it's just a mistake. Um, your names, check the innocent. Okay. So good. So some discussion on the first one. All right. So explain the explain the answer here. Anyone want to argue for anything else? Okay. This one was hard for Potter and Peter. Um, let's advocate an answer here. Finally, this one. What? So what, how are they Why do I care? I'm torturing you with this. Right. And why, why do I want you to read a tree, though? Right. So I, I told you that. Right. I could be wrong. Right. So what, why is reading a tree important? tree to you know because we'll do all the cool things we have trees for but also just understand relationships and also if you're building a tree then you know you can read it and say oh wait that's weird I don't think that you know car for a kind of flower um, you can do that so you can read your own trees as well good okay so <coughs> so we're talking about gene trees piece of tree incongruence and related issues and then we're going to start on an exercise where actually we start analyzing some real data. Okay? So we talked about this before, right? So here we have, you know, a species, maybe two species, there are all these complex history happening inside it, right? And so until now in this class, we've been assuming that this history matches this history, right? So we just, and so we just take, you know, any old gene and reconstruct it, and this history will matches this history. Right? This is is it going to always be true? No, it's science, right? Um, 
biology more precisely. So it cause it to mess up. Why is it a harder problem? Though? Mm -hmm. Right, so one thing that could be gene flow. Um, if it's a network rather than a trait. Right, and something we start, we have some methods to deal with that now, but they're still not useful commonly. Okay, good. What else? Mm -hmm. That could be gene duplications, right? So orthology, pyrology. So we have pyrology issues. Um, so we could sequence. Um, you know, uh, you know, if, if chimps, and, so chimps and uh, humans share many alleles for certain genes, or for gene copies. If you se sequence my gene copy and homologous, you know, chimps and gene copy, and then a, a duplicate of that gene in a different human might come out with me being sister to chimps and the other human sister to us. Like if we have a history of. They have one gene, they have two different genes, right, the gene duplication, and then <coughs> it's like that. Um, but if I sequence, so that every human has copy A and copy B, every gen has copy A and copy B, and I'm not sure if they're going to be or two. But if I sequence, you know, A for you, and A for the chimp, and B for someone else, I, I think that, okay, you know, this is consistent to this. Okay. okay. And that's a big problem. Uh, so, this sort of gene duplication and having this sort of state of a pyrology issue. Pyrology. Yeah. Yeah. Pyrology the same gene, and pyrology mistaken. But the gene duplication is a common feature through life, right? We know of, you know, plants that go through polypolarization events and things like that. <coughs> uh, P-A-R-A-L-O-G-Y. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so this can be a real, real issue, too. And so you might, so, you know, people who are working in the field try to make sure they're using the same model of sequence. Um, and, the, and if you're doing like large scale phylogenetics, there's actually sort of various ad hoc tests you can do. Like, you know, is this, is this species a clade for, these, for this gene? And if not, maybe you have a gene A and a B. You can just throw those data out. Okay, so at large, so, uh, so the old sort of scale, at least I used to do, where you have your three genes and your eight genes, you know, you, you get each one, you look at it carefully, and things like that. You can say, okay, well, I know this one has an intron, and so this other copy has an intron. That copy doesn't have an intron, must be a different copy. I'll throw that out. And I'll cut out my little gels and toss it. Right? Now, modern scale large genome stuff, you have thousands of genes you're doing. You're not looking for each one of your ones. You're just looking for things that, 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 I'm not sure about that one, toss it. I'm not sure about that one, toss it. When you throw away tons of your data, you still have tons left. There's a very different you know, mindset for people who are used to you know, fighting hard for every little base pair. They're like, yeah, I just toss half of it. Um, that's the world we live in now. <coughs> okay, you also have this sort of gene tree, species tree issue. Right, so it's sort of come, comes up in the Madison paper. Right. So what could happen here? Does this remind you of any, anything you've seen in PopGen? Do you cover coalescence at all? So what's coalescence? So did you cover in the core this this year or no? I'm not sure if you did or not. Okay. So 
Right. Yeah, I mean, the trouble there is the, the trees are drawn upside down, like how we're drawing them here. Right. But once you get past that. Population. And I put two copies in the present, right? And I trace them back, and you know each one gets a pair at random, right? And then I can do the same thing again, a pair at random, but at some point, by chance, I have the same pair. And the coalesce. Does that sound familiar? Okay. What makes that more likely? So I might. So so yeah. So I might have to, I might have to go longer or shorter. So here I had to go, you know, one, two, three steps back to get coalescence, right? Other case situations where I might have to go three hundred steps back. What would that be? Dispersal, how? Right, so they have some sort of population subdivision. Right. Um, if I pick up, you know, the uh, next one. I pick the wheel over here. Right. Maybe it's very, very messy from the cross to the south. Right. Maybe, you know, this is island one or island two. Right. And so it's very hard to you know, so I might have to go back a long time before any of them probably crosses that boundary to coalesce. Right? But this migration is very, very, very low. So that's a population subdivision can lead to a long time. It's good. What else? Um, yeah, I mean, so, did you have actually the effect of inbreeding, things like that? Because you'd have, you know, that's the time of coalescence, you know, it's like you and your sister who mate, um, but then a lengthy population history, I'm not sure what, you know, so you have that pair, but then they, they breed less with things outside of them, and so I'm not sure what the effect of that would be on the population size. I should know that by then. Anyone know? Okay. Um, what else? Population size, right? Why? What? Okay. Well, imagine we had a population here of just, you know, two individuals. Right? So, you know, you might not, inter you might not have the same parent here, you might not here, but at some point, there's a very good chance that we'll share a parent. Right? Whereas we have a thousand, so, you know, basically, this one chooses parent A. Right? Now, there's a good chance that this one chooses the same parent again. Right? What if I had three, pop three individuals in the population? The chance of having them a hit in one, in one generation? One third. What if I had, you know, 40 individuals? Right, one forty. Yeah. I'm gonna say it's one. Just one one over the haploid. Uh, no, two two n. So, right for diploid, if we're doing n is a census size, yeah. Yeah, here we're doing a haploids, but right, if you're doing diploid, it'd be two n. Yep, good. Okay, so larger population size means a longer time to coalescence. Okay, good. Why does that matter here?
Nope. Um, yeah, the speciation process is, again, it's, it could be, it's, it's definitely affected by genes, but it's a different sort of scale of process than this. Mm -hmm. Right, so how, what, what makes them not line up as well? Uh, so we'll, for, the, for them to line up, what does it actually mean? It's good. They need to have to share the same point of common ancestry. Right, within a species. Right? Yeah. So for the lineup, you want each species to be a clade. Right? And so how long does your species become clade? What does that make the species become a clade? For a gene. Right, so I know that, you know, our mitochondria all share more recent common ancestry than they do with any mitochondria in, in bonobos. Right, so for mitochondrial genes, humans are a clade. Right, whereas for some blood group genes, they're not. Okay. <coughs> so what does it mean for, you know, a whole species to become a clade for a gene? No, so clades, you can have a clade that has, I mean, a clade just describes ancestry. You can detect them with snake morphies. Maybe you don't have a snake morphies, you still have a clade. Okay. You have one common ancestor, right. Presumably within the species, right. Not necessarily. Um, and so here, <coughs> you know, this, has that happened yet? Is this species a clade? No? Why not? Exactly. So this individual and this individual share a component of stuff here back here. So is this individual What could make it a clade? One gene right now, yeah. Or this one gets sampled out. Either way, it gets into the clay. Right? And so if I wait long enough, eventually, you know, by chance, this works. There's only two right now in the population that have this. So you might have one and then zero. This one might have you know, three, but two ones, but you would have zero. Right? And so just when, you know, by chance, it will eventually be clay. Right? Now, if A is a small, if A species is you know, a smaller population size, what will happen? Will it speed up or slow down that process? Speed up, right. What if it was huge? Slow down, right. Perfect, right? And so this time for a species to become a clade for a gene is affected by, you know, how <coughs> the things that affect population size. So the things like, you know, population subdivision are things that increase the effective population size. And so they'll slow down this time to coalescence. And so here this shows this, right? So B and C, right? So B and C are a clade, right? Their population history is that, such that you know, these two groups share more than you know, than anything else, right? But are all genes that way in B and C? Maybe, maybe not, right? And this shows the case where it's not. So what's happened here? Right. Because 
you know, through this DC lineage here, maintain two different copies of this open street, right? And so they just by chance have one of those things, and then, you know, they both be the God or both be Solomon, right? And if this were a long, if the delivery is longer, it would be less, it would be more going to have that happen since they're longer, right? It would be narrower, it would be more going to happen, right? And so, to have these pursuits over this very long skinny branch is very unlikely. Whereas a short fat branch right here. Right? Um, minor situation. My species tree is this, right? Where I have one species up here between this and you know, A, B, C. So here I have a between A, B, and C, and here is between A and B. Now the only time, the only um, way I can recover this you know, on the phylogeny is if I have you know, whatever the history is. Um, something such that I have these coalescing and then coalescing with these. I'll try to do this today. Um, and then later coalescing here. Right? But the chance of having from this coalescence to this coalescence in the short time period are pretty low. Right? It's more likely that I have multiple of those persistent down here. And once I get, you know, the copy of this thing in here, right, the copy of this thing over there, now it's just random choice, random chance, you know, with this one, or with this one, or with this one, or with this one, right, it's going to be very hard to infer that phylogeny. So if I had this time period here, much, much, much longer, and a small pop bottleneck, much greater chance of having that AB plate appear in the coalescing history. Right? And that's all this is getting at. <coughs> you have a short fat branch, and you have this incumbent, the gene tree and species tree. Okay. Does this have to be recent for this to happen? Exactly. Which is something most people actually in this area don't realize that, you know, you can have this happening in the Cambrian, right? Uh, within an orthopod radiation, right? Where your short fat version, you know, 30 million years ago. Right? And then after that, you know, more, you know, 30 million years more won't fix that problem. Like that's just, that, you know, those, those, you need to be fixed. Okay? So if you think that all the really matters when you have radiation, but no, it doesn't anywhere on a trip. All that matters is that you have short, fat branches somewhere. <coughs> and even with long, narrow branches, there's a non-zero risk of this. Because you have enough branches, it's going to happen somewhere. What's the risk of you know, getting killed in a car? Right? You have a car made of cardboard, pretty high. You have a higher car made of steel or carbon fiber, probably lower, still non-zero. If you keep driving enough on phylogeny, you're going to run into this problem. Yeah. So narrow is the, the so on this sort of plot, narrow versus the population size. 
Right, so here we have a small population size in time, with a big population size. And of course, longer means more time, so more chances we have coalescence within that branch. So the chance of having a coalescence event is 1 over 2n. So not having one is 1 minus 1 over 2n, right? So I have to have, you know, get that, you know, 1, one minus 1 over 2n raised to the number of generations in the branch. And so if I have, um, you know, a very short branch, it's a feasible chance to have. If I have a very long branch, it's less likely. What? What? Yeah, it was, yeah. It, it, so if it affects the coalescence time, it's for the coalescence time, then how it affects this too. Okay. Yeah. Well, so this is, this is the problem. So if you do a single gene, you know, my data is going to say that C should C should be a D. Right? And that's the equation now. Um, what happens if you have multiple genes? Um, I could have, you know, normally, if I'm lucky, you know, you can see you know, the gene tree was almost usually matching the species tree. Right? But with which one can directly fail to match. And so by chance, you know, this is a situation, you know, people didn't come up with the right tree. But it could be unlucky. Or we have, you know, we have lucky twice, or we have a history of lucky once, or you put them there. <coughs> if the true tree is short and wide, this is more likely to happen. Right? If it's long and narrow, it can still happen. Though. So right now it, we're assuming there's no selection. Right? If we have selection for um, variation, right? So like NHC alleles or one where you know it's very different, or sulking is very different, then it decreases. It, it makes it less likely to coalesce because we're both going to do that. It shows the problem. Um, we have things that have a different effect of population size, then that can affect it too. So mitochondrial genes versus nuclear genes. Which is a small population size. What? Right. Exactly. So if I didn't affect the population size, then the haploid alleles in the genes is a lot smaller. And so you might expect mitochondria to better reflect the true tree or chlor chloroplast. These are all subject to this will include any sort of issues that we call it. Okay. Um, so I just use mitochondria and chloroplast all the time. Throw away these messy nuclear genes. It's a. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so. It's. It's not. Let's say you're if you're saying, if you're looking at something. Uh, really big, small population, not going to. Right. So, basically, you know, what matters in terms of whether you have a gene that's useful for phylogenetics is you have problems like this. The other problems of having lack of signal, right? So, you get, which could be two things. It could be not enough rate of evolution, right? So, trying to do a mammal phylogeny based on number of limbs, right? There's some data there, right? So, whales pop out as a clade. Great. There's not a lot of information about resolving everything else. Because if I do, you know, full, you know, chloroplast genome, there's a lot more data there. Right? And so some traits, like especially in plants and chloroplast genes, might be evolving too slowly to have signal used to recover this. 
Um, sometimes mitochondrial genes are actually have the opposite problem. They're evolving too fast and too have noise, right? So <coughs> if every if every character is changed multiple times, it's not enough signal to pick up these deep branching events. Because we have sort of the right rate. Um, and actually, Randy Smalls in our department, one of the set of papers he was involved with, um, was looking at how to find genes that have the right rate of evolution to help resolve these questions. Because right? you want something that is fast enough to actually click within these in the branching events, um, but then not get wiped out by later changes. So. Okay? All right, so, my friend of course, be good for this reason, but for other reasons, if things too slow or too fast, it might not be. Another issue is that they only show you one history each. Right? So in theory, if I have a bunch of independent genes that are recombining, right? each one of a separate chromosome, each one is a different raw human process. Right? Mitochondria and chloroplast, you know, all the genes in the chloroplast have the same history. Right? All the genes in the mitochondria have the same history. There's no recombination. Um, and so they all have the same history. They only get you know, two shots of Maybe can go with nuclear, nuclear genes. That make sense? It's a matter of people. So there are some fossils that have no genes. Other questions about this? Okay, so. Rare coalescence is just like the coalescence process. Deep coalescence is a Madison name for um, this, what we call it, linear sorting as well. This, where you don't have things coalescing in the linear, you have it going back to an earlier point and then coalescing. So that's because you know, that's you're getting into the wrong, so the wrong topology. Um, Math uses that term a lot. Most people don't use that, they just use incomplete linear sorting. Okay. Um, he has a method that minimizes this. Plus his cost, but we we'll into that. <coughs> um, another thing to think about is um, what branch links do. Right? We care about branch links too. We talk about like different rates of evolution and things like that. We have previous rates of evolution time, so we need you know, good SOC rates. What is this, you know, even if the gene topology matches the species topology, will the branch length match? Okay. Um, so even if, this, if the gene tree and species tree match in terms of topology, will the branch length match? Okay. That's the first step of, the, of knowledge. Okay. Why not? Well, we can think of why, why they may not. We need some, some bias. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, good. So, yeah, so what do I mean by branch length here? So, if, if you're thinking about like species as a whole, like the amount of changes, you know, morphologically they have more changes than they have, they have fewer changes than they have genetically, because you have these sites genetically. So, that's certainly true. Um, what we're thinking about here, though, is you know, the amount of difference between A and B, um, A and C, like that. Um, or if we think about, if we have, you know, if we have a perfect clock of, we know when the species diverged. We can not get a perfect clock for the gene. Evolving perfect enough of the clock. Would those branch lengths match up? So the very thing is probably the rejection of the clock, like that transformation of the cut and the clock up. Good. What else is about how the gene can be generated because the even if we're evolving under a perfect clock, but I could date the fill-up of time of A and B to that gene to the power. Right? That's maximum coalesce. Um, 
Alright, so let's think about the fact that you can straight. Right? A and B. Pretty simple. Alright, now I have two cards. We have a G for each. When could when could it coalesce? Almost the, the longer. Yeah, exactly. Right, so when did they call us? They call us right here. Right? So just, you know, the last minute they were from the, they burst from the different species, so it's an instantaneous process, right? They call us. Right? Also occur here. Right? Or occur here. And so this split between A and B of the G tree, always, assuming, you know, the clock predates the species tree. Does that make sense? No? Okay. Ask, ask questions. Right. Exactly. Yep. Right, because I assume it can't have been here because now they're not integrated anymore. So it has to be right here or over there. What affects the magnitude of that bias? Under which situations would it be pretty close to the speciation time? Nope. We're assuming, we're assuming that already. Yeah. Okay, so it could be something like that, right? So we're now I've evolved this um, trait that makes me not sex into that other group, and so right. Um, most of the time we're assuming these are neutral. It's always good to think about, you know, this is, that, that's a pretty big assumption. We know life is not neutral, right? So it makes math a whole lot easier. But it's worth thinking about, well, that's not really true. Good. What else? Okay, compare this tree to... <coughs> Which part has more bias in terms of the make make the difference between the the, the right why? Right, so one thing is like how long, well, that does sort of true in general, though. I mean, here I'm only looking at particular alleles, so it could be that I still have tons of stuff that hasn't coalesced. These are the two particular copies. But I mean, you're getting there. Almost there. So, what do we say affects the coalescence time? Population size. Population size, population size right? And so, the chance of these two coalescing. Increase generation is one over two n, right? And so think about okay, I have one generation, two generation, three generation, four generation. Okay, so if this is a small population size, right? This is just two individuals. The chance of it going to here, you know, good. Going to here at this point is probably really unlikely to have to go all the way down to here and all the way here. So the chance of population size is huge. But that time to coalescence is much greater than that. Much greater than two. Right? Does that make sense?
Uh, no, it's based on the, the chance of you and I having the same parent. Right? So if we're, that's, that's what the coalescence is. And the beauty of a coalescence approach is that it's, it's this backward in time model. Right? So all we care about is um, who the survivors are and who their parents are. Right? There's a whole bunch of you know, losers that have no kids in this scenario. It's, val it's a valid life choice. Coalescence, you know. Um, they have no offspring, right? And so simulating that, you know, forward in time, this in that, okay, here we have this, you know, this population, and this is out, and it's made of all those individuals. The coalescence, all we care about is figuring out when this lineage picks up with this lineage, right? And also, it's got a thing we don't care about. It makes it much, much easier to simulate. Mm -hmm. Right, because that has the same effect of increasing the population size and thus making it slow, slower time to coalescence. Good. Okay. So there's another thing you have to worry about. And that, you know, all, all the age estimates you get from the gene trees would tend to be a little older than they should be in your in your species tree. Right? And that's not something you worry about much in practice because you always assume it's so noisy anyway. The, eh, a little bias plus the noise is still just pretty noisy. Okay. Um, but it is still a, a bias. Okay, that's, that's, that's a great, great question. Okay. Um, right, so imagine you have You know, here I have human, chimp, bonobo. Okay? And imagine this is CO1. So cytochromoxidase 1, gene used in part of the prep cycle, I think, mitochondria. Right? Um, these are. <coughs> so we all have that same gene. Right? And, you know, most life that uses mitochondria has that gene. So what do you mean their gene chains? Well, we had different, um, we had slightly different sequences of it. Right? So here we have the same amino acids for everything. Like I'm only changing at the third base pair position for these same amino acids. Right? So functionally it looks exactly the same way. Right? The code might be, might be um, you know, identical or just slightly different. Right? So what we're talking about here is <coughs> um, what, what this, these histories are. But these are still, right, so these are the same genes, but just sort of different alleles. And actually, in the coalescent literature, there's a difference between um, identity by descent and identity by state, right? And so, um, identity by state would be if I have something um, like this, where the same sequence, but really the instance of this one had an A here, and this one had a C here. That's the age of history. But now they're identically identical by state. I can't, I can't distinguish them with real data, right? They have a different history, so they have a different history by descent. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you have more, more questions about it? Okay. All right. Okay. Other questions about this? All right. So big picture. Why do we care? You know, two n matters in the empty different populations. Okay, great. So what? What is the goal of life? 
Okay, we're a phylogenetic tree, that's right. right? So <laughs> that's what we want. Why is, that why is this relevant for that? We want to get the right tree, right? And so this is stuff that can make us get the wrong tree. That bothers us a lot. Okay? Um, <coughs> and so the projects we talked about so far in the class assume that once you have the right history for a gene tree, you have the right species tree as well. And what we care about the species tree. And what this whole thing tells us is that actually maybe not. Maybe something the gene tree doesn't match the species tree. Because that's how we use science. So what we can do is look at multiple genes. Right? If they all give us the same history, hey, maybe it's the right history. Right? So that's one thing that can help us. Um, another thing we can do is we can generate methods to deal with this. <coughs> okay? And here are a few of them. And we're not going to get into running them or things like that. Um, so be pretty detailed. People are using these. Right? So gene tree parsimony. Um, what you do is you infer the gene tree for each species for each gene separately, right? and try to find the species tree that minimizes the number of duplications on that gene uh, of those gene trees. So, and if you minimize the number of those, um, you know, how many times we have to have you know copies of the gene being present throughout a lineage, multiple copies. So it goes back to This sort of thing. You might think that having you know, these two persist is less likely than having it coalesce. Right? But what I want to try to do is minimize the time they have to have this duplication. Okay? Masson talks about minimizing deep coalescences, similar sort of measure. Right? We try to minimize and reduce sort of ad hoc things that have to persist in time. Okay? <coughs> and as we they were developed by Slutsky et al. They were very cool, um, both who worked, worked on herps, worked on venomous snakes, and also did really cool method development. And they died in the field, you know, the time of his life. What? Oh, what? Uh. Yeah, I mean, apparently someone was assisting in the field, told them it was one kind of snake, and he reached in, and it was not that kind of snake. And yeah, but his work is dangerous. But, I mean, but he's, it's amazing because he did, you know, he's a great field biologist, but also did a lot of cool method stuff, too. Um, and then the various you know, methods, the humbly named best method, for example, <coughs> is the Bayesian approach, um, where you have, you know, you have a set of a model of DNA, data, there's one that you need to figure out what the gene trees are, and try to figure out the species tree that's most likely. So the model of evolution of gene trees and species trees is like a model of evolution of um, DNA on trees. Right? And you can find those likelihoods together. Yes. Evasion estimate of species tree. Yeah. Um, um, stem. Um, here, rather than going from the DNA and looking for the joint estimate of the species tree and integrating over the gene trees, this takes the gene trees as given and uses those to maximize the probability of the species tree given the gene tree. Right. So we talked about you know, we talked about how to calculate the likelihood of DNA data on a tree. And so we can figure out the probability of a given gene history on a species tree. So, Again, back to here. Given the this set of branch lengths, you know, um, that sees these data, this the history, starts to show something this history, that this history, this history, this history, and this history. Right? Whereas if I see this more often, it would suggest that this branch is static. Right? And so I could optimize the level of the model to try to fit these data. Questions about that? Okay. Um, and the star beast is similar to best actually how it works. Okay. Uh, we use beast in the in the program we're using. Star beast is a modification of that further to deal with this 
Yeah, there's lack of karma between G2 and G3, so it's just an empty model. Okay. And so all these approaches can deal with this heterogeneity in various ways. Um, still not used very often. We still typically use um, programs like Raxamel or Mr. Bayes or Regular Beast. We don't deal with this issue. Okay. Um, what we know this issue is, is present. And so to do a really thorough job, we might want to include these. Okay. Any questions about that? <coughs> okay. Um, one other thing, this isn't used much as much now, but it's worth learning about, it might help you with your new projects, is how to combine information from different trees. Right, so imagine here we have you know, these two trees, and they have some taxa in common, and some taxa not in common. Right? So there should be a way to merge this information. Um, and we have an approach like this. Uh, and this is called doing stupid trees. Basically, they give you, you know, these two trees and said, what's the, what's the sort of combined tree that represents both these trees? Could you, could you, do, could you do that? So we want to try. Walk through your reasoning as you're going. Oh, well, the reason is that you have conflict or not. We are going to have conflict for ID, R, in both cases. Super taxa, mm -hmm. and then there's super taxa in one case, it's E, D, and in the other case, it's F. So we don't have F in the other one. So we mm -hmm. basically just add it in. And the same for D. Additional information that you know that F and G are in between A, B, and C. And then you have C in one case, and C and D in the other one, and C and D is missing. You know, mm -hmm. And then you have Now, can you see how that happened? Okay. This is a super cool case because these are perfectly compatible. Right? And so you can see this represents I have both the A tree, this first tree, which is the purple and red lines, that's present there. And I have this blue tree, which is the purple and blue lines, that's present there. Right? And so I combine these two trees together to make one tree. Okay? This is an approach called super tree approach. It allows you to combine two or more trees if the sets of taxa do not overlap completely. Okay. If, the, if the sets of taxa overlap completely, it's a consensus approach. Okay. But here we have, you know, and this is nice because you know people are making individual trees. I, I make a tree of vertebrates. You make a tree of mammals, right? That has better sampling of mammals. If you merge them together, sure, using a super tree approach. Okay. Now this. This particular one is easy because they don't conflict. Right? But they do conflict as ways of dealing with that. Okay. Well, right, but so the algorithm that Orlando used, though, of you know, finding clades that work together, right, um, wouldn't work if I had um, E to be here. Right? There's no single tree that has both those trees. So then what do you do? So you can show it as a polytomy, right? Um, you can also, what if, I, what if I have plenty of this tree and only one of the tree that has P and E? Right, how do you, you know, maybe you don't want to do it as a polytomy, you want to show like, oh, most of the trees think this. And so there's ways to deal with that conflict too.
So, for example, there's a nature paper published a few years ago that combined a bunch of mammal trees, including taxonomy trees, to get this tree and all that. So it turned out it's really a pleasant family. The apple tree has, I think, 4,500 species of mammals in one tree. And they added dates to it using a complex way of mixing fossil ages with mixing You know, if you, want, if you want to use a phylogeny to correct for an amount of dependence, you need reference for that. So what do you do? You wait until you get such a phylogeny to hack it together. Right? And so there's any sort of hack it together Okay. <coughs> um, and right now there's another group that's funded by NSF, to the tune of like $50 million, that's trying to create one tree of life. It's called the One Tree Group. Um, and so they're creating a phylogeny that has every taxon in Gembang plus every taxon in various sets of taxonomy on a single tree. Okay. Yeah, big sheet of paper. <laughs> um, so they've worked with a group where you, can, where you can zoom in and out, so you can you know, look at high level this vertebrates if you zoom in, okay, look, there, there I am, you know. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah, a giant hedge maze. You know, or something. <laughs> actually, actually, the, when I was an undergrad, so one of my instructors was Stephen Jay Gould, who's this great macro vision guy. Um, Shall know who he is? Um, but he took us on a field trip down to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. And there, the way they've arranged their gallery is by a phylo phylogeny. And so you walk and you have like nodes, you go to nodes, you branch off. And it's, like, it's awesome. Things are hard to revise it though, like chisel out, but well, that's not quite anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. How knowledge works. Okay. <coughs> so you can think, how would you combine this information, right? Especially if it conflicts. And so one way people do it, and they don't need to get into the details of this because it's not what people do much anymore, um, is major representation of parsimony. Right, where what you do is is code each tree in a series of clades. Right, so A and B make clades. So they make you know one made of character that has A and B as a clade, one one, there's one zero. C and D are clade. A B C D are clade. Right, similar going from if I were to do like a parsimony analysis of the of the of this data set, I would get back this tree. Right, and do the same thing for the other tree. It is the way of encoding a tree as a character matrix. Okay. What people we'll do in this case is they then <coughs> combine these two character matrices to make one giant character matrix. Right? Where I have, you know, this character has no information about F. Right? So F question mark, D question mark. Same way as if I you know, sequence DNA and just that part, that space hasn't come out. And so then you can use this to do a parsimony search on this combined matrix and find a tree that, if everything's perfectly compatible, we'll get the right tree. Right. If there's conflict, it will, you know, deal with that conflict by the tree that has fewest various differences from the tree. Okay. This approach was caught popular for a while in the 1990s and early 2000s. Okay. Won't be a problem with this. Right, so this. Can you combine those trees when you're looking at the Exactly. This is a way of combining topologies, but not really trees with, with ages. Right? And so if this tree has A and B 10 million years ago, this tree has 100 million years ago, 
that equation is equal to sort of analysis. Right? What else? What if this tree is awesome? This tree is based on, you know, 40 genes for each species, well aligned, and perfect rates, and this one's based on, you know, the old guy drawing a napkin. I think it's this way. But, all right, not right. So that information doesn't get into here either. Right. <coughs> okay. And there are other subtler problems about, you know, tree shape mattering. So if you have a tree like this, it's like this is flipped. The tree wins because the tree is the AD thing. I have targets here, 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 supporting it, and here you have here and here. And so, technically, trees tend to be weighed more in this sort of analysis. Not, not important to worry about, just none of the sort of bias, biases that come into it. Okay. <coughs> um, so what we'll do more nowadays is something called a super matrix. All right. Which, rather than combining structures from the trees, they go back to the raw data. And put together the raw data. And so I might have the you know, question marks for F for all these sites, question marks for D for all these sites. So they'll put them in and run analysis. And as people now moving more toward using the same sorts of data, nucleotide data, it becomes easier to combine things. Right? And they still combine them. I could, I could do morphology for one and nucleotide data for another, and many programs could deal with that. That's a fairly new thing. Okay. okay, your problem with this sort of analysis. Right, so maybe if it has something to have no genes, it might not put it into my sort of analysis, right? So I have some, yeah, I have some non-avian dinos, but you know what? They're a pain in the neck, they're morphology, and if I deal with them, toss it. Right, whereas your matrix, yeah, okay, it's easy to code that tree and code this tree. Okay, what else could be a problem with this? Ah, good point. So if I link them in one model, I would be assuming that. So what I could do instead is do, you remember talk about last time about partitioning. We'll often do is do a partition model. And that can actually be very important if you're involved in the rate of gaps. Because if I have, if this gene going slowly, this gene going quickly, then I'm missing this, right, might make me think that, okay, here I have, you know, whatever I have for F is always long, because I'm going to do the F branch is very long. Right? And I have a single rate model. Mm -hmm. If I separate it, I can use that correctly. Good. Yeah, what else? Uh, actually, we're assuming they're measuring different, they're just you know, taking different things and lump genes together, assuming they're different genes. Um, but it could be that you know, this study is based on CO1 and EF1 alpha, and this study is based on C1, and it's stick them together, it might be having you know, two copies of CO1. And this is what people do now more than just sort of lumping them together, is actually going back to GenBank, some other repository, and pulling these down de novo. Um, <coughs> this is an approach now called flawed. Um, P H L, that's an F L, which is clever, um, phylogeny something, and you basically give it a set of, of clade you want to look at, and look at angiosperms, and what genes you want, and we'll download all the relevant genes, and align them in the tree. So a lot of the, the giant trees of the and taxa are being done that way now. It's basically a super matrix approach. Okay, so. Because it's a matrix of one. There was a while where there was lots of debate, and so people were papers back and forth, back and forth, which was great for both of them, and getting stuff out. Right? But now it's sort of settled on to the most of the matrices. Any questions about that? All right, let's take a five minute break. We're going to have to do something a little bit more active. So, 342, or 52.